Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a deal apparently is done regarding the state budget. We'll have the latest. We'll hear about the rapid increase in spending on Arizona congressional races, and we'll see how the Audubon Society transformed an industrial dump into a place to learn about desert wildlife. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. An apparent breakthrough at the state capitol as lawmakers reach an agreement on a spending plan. Here with an update is Jim Small of the Arizona Capital Times. And Jim, we don't get to say this much on Arizona Horizon, but breaking news here at 530. Uh, and they got this thing figured out, huh? Yeah, it, it looks like they should have a budget vote done by the end of the night. Uh, probably not, you know, a couple, few more hours. Mm -hmm. um, they they come, came up with a deal. There was a, a proposal that was made that the the Arizona House and the governor's office Thursday last week made a proposal to the Senate and said, look, here's, you know, here's where we're at. This is kind of, you know, take it or leave it. And the Senate over the weekend worked on it, uh, looked at it, made a couple of smi minor changes, a couple of really small tweaks to it. And today the Senate said, okay, we, we can live with this. We can agree with it. Well, let's go see if we have the votes. They found the votes. And so this afternoon, uh, the House and Senate met together at a conference committee, essentially, to put these final amendments onto the budget package. And we should mention that the, it seemed like the governor and the House were kind of on the same page here heading in. And, but, but it sounded like Senate President Andy Biggs, who was going to be on the program tonight, we thank you for coming in, but obviously he's very busy right now, along with the Speaker of the House, Andy Tobin. It sounded though as though President Biggs was saying, give me the names, show me the votes. I'm not doing anything until you are sure you got this. Yeah, and there was some, you know, we talked to some folks in the Senate about that issue as to, okay, w why the insistence that we see this, you know, this list of names and who's going to vote for it. And, and there was a, a general feeling in the Senate that th they had agreements in the past on the budget with the House. And, you know, so that they passed the first budget, sent it to the House, expected it to pass. And, the House said, no, we're not going to pass it this way. There were, there were a half dozen Republican legislators who kind of dug their heels in and said, no, we want these certain things to be addressed. And so the House made changes, sent it back mm -hmm. to the Senate, and the Senate wasn't happy about that. And so they made their own changes back and, you know, ostensibly with the understanding that the House would then support that. And then the House didn't support those amendments. And so that was kind of how we got here. And, and so it seems that there was a, a, a desire to avoid a situation where they agree on something, and the House goes, oh, wait, ah, sorry, just kidding. We don't actually have the votes for it. We have to make more changes. So what? The, let's talk with the child agency funding, because that's a very big aspect of all of this. What does the deal say about that? Is everything up front, or are we going to see some more funding later on? Well, the funding levels are going to basically stay stay where they're at, you know, in, in terms of, of it was a compromise amount. I think it was somewhere around $20 million. Mm -hmm. The governor had initially asked for $25 million. So it's going to stay at that $20 million. But the bigger deal with that child, the new child welfare agency is, is it's an intent language, essentially. So the House, when they passed it, they put intent language on there that said the legislature intends to come back and deal with this problem and address and provide the adequate funding to address all of these, these issues that may arise with this new agency. The Senate changed it and said, the legislature will come back and do it, but only after the agency is completely separated from the Department of Economic Security and there's some certain kind of certain thresholds that are met. And the, the House didn't like that issue. Governor's office clearly didn't like that language. So the the final version of the budget will have the language that the House passed a, a couple of weeks so ago. So the intent language stays? Correct. Okay, so the House, House and the governor kind of won on that one. Yes. What about the uh, the charter the district charter program? That was a big issue as well. That was, in fact, that was really the driving issue in the House. That was the thing that led, you know, primarily led those six Republicans to dig their heels in. And so the Senate had proposed getting rid of all funding for these district charter schools for basically the current fiscal year. Uh, the House had said, well, let's leave it for this year and then we'll scrap it in the future uh, at a cost of about $33 million. Senate came back after that and said, no, we'll knock it down to $16 million. We'll cut it in half. So the, the, final, the final place where they landed on that is going to be $24.5 million. So not quite the full amount, the $33 million for the year, but just a, a tick under $25 million, which gets them, gets them through most of the year and, and Obviously, going forward into next year, this pr this program is going to be ended. Yeah, it basically allows them to land the plane because the plane's not going anywhere after this year. Correct, correct. And so the school districts now are going to have to figure out what to do with those with those schools and and how to, how do they want to handle what it. What about university funding? I know that was an issue as well. It was. Uh, there's a little bit more added in. I think the governor was looking for 15 million dollars or so. I, they're going to end up around four and a half million dollars in new money, mm -hmm. uh, 
which is down from the five and a half the, the House wanted, but it's up a little bit from, it was a little bit under three that the Senate budget had last week. Uh, we keep getting back to uh, child welfare agencies and such. Are we seeing, uh, there was so much talk about let's get preventative services funded to keep kids out of whatever uh, comes after CPS. Did those services see any bumps, any significant bumps? No, not in terms of new spending. Uh, you know, the, the spending levels on those are going to stay what they ha what they have been. Uh, you know, one of the big ones that there was a lot of push for was for child care subsidies, which is basically a it's it's a subsidy given to working poor families and, and generally single mothers, so that way they can go to work and their kid they can put their kids into a daycare and, and that cost. Uh, is, is subsidized as anyone with a child knows that cost can can really pile up real quick. So th there there is some funding in the budget for that, but it's not new funding over what has been in, in past budgets, and, and it means that the backlog is going to continue. There's like I think someone like five or six thousand people that are backlogged onto this list that can't get into the program. And there are caps on that program, correct? Correct. And the I, I, I had heard, probably read in your paper somewhere, uh, that one of the problems the Senate had with coming back and addressing CPS in a special session or at a later date was that that was a way to get rid of those caps and they don't want to see those caps go away. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that is an issue. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a divide even amongst Republicans as to whether that kind of spending is you know, a handout or whether it's, this is, you know, there, there's a number of Republicans who've made the argument that say, look, this is exactly the kind of government subsidy. I mean, if we're going to have one, it's, it's one that allows people to go to work, put their kids into a safe place and not have to make a decision between showing up at your, at your job for your shift or putting your kid in a dangerous situation. So where do we see what, what happens next here as far as the budget and as far as this uh, post CPS is concerned? Will we have a, a special uh, session coming up, do you think? Yeah, I, I, it looks like we will. I know the governor said last week she expects a special session to deal with some of the policy work required to create that new agency and then no doubt if they if they need additional funding the intent language here says that the legislature will come back and provide that. All right but a done deal Jim great work good to have you thanks for stopping in. The Arizona Republic reports that spending on Arizona congressional races tripled from 2010 to 2012, that following a controversial campaign finance ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court. Here with more is Rebecca Sanders of the Arizona Republic. Rebecca, this is a great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great work on this particular project. That was 2010 to 2012. From 2012 to now, it's really exploded, hasn't it? That's right. It remains to be seen. Will this uh, flood of money into congressional races from outside groups continue? We do have fewer competitive races than we had in 2012. But what's interesting is that up until today, uh, the pace of spending has, has superseded any previous election cycle. So we could be in for a record year. And we, I think we have a graphic here from uh, 20, 2008, 2010, 2012, and to date in 2014. Goodness gracious, look at that. I mean, that is ridiculous. That's, that's the spending to date in each of those election years. And it really shows that at least for this uh, cycle, it looks to be on track to uh, eclipse any of those previous years. Okay, who is spending this money? So this, we're talking about money that outside groups that are not affiliated with any of the candidates or their campaigns are spending on these elections. So this doesn't include the millions that candidates raise and spend themselves every election. These are groups that usually have a kind of ideological bent or represent special interest groups, whether that's veterans or, uh, you know, 
dentists or what huh. have you, um, because you know even even medical professionals, for instance, have supported some candidates in Arizona. It seems as though early on the big money groups, the ones making the most noise, conservative groups. Nationally, that is the case. Conservative groups have far outspent liberal ones. But interestingly, when I did the analysis of the spending here in Arizona congressional races, they were nearly even, yeah, uh, slightly more on the conservative side. What's interesting is um, also we counted up the number of groups that have played in Arizona since 2010, more than 100. It's really mushroomed since these Supreme Court decisions loosened these rules. And again, these are groups made up mostly of anonymous donors. We really don't know who's behind all these things. Sure, it depends on the way that the group is created, under which uh, part of the tax code or part of the campaign finance rules. Super PACs, those um, do have to disclose their donors. Um, and can spend unlimited amounts and collect unlimited amounts. Um, 501c4s, which are the um, other main type of group, don't have to disclose their donors. So there is this question of anonymity, and yes. is that good for the voter or not? Well, and you mentioned the Supreme Court. Obviously, Citizens United, unlimited uh, uh, donations are okay from the people, from people, corporations, and unions. And we just recently, though, had this decision. Uh, we looked at the overall uh, number of donations. And talk to us through this now. The thinking is this latest decision might take some of the effect off of Citizens United because it gets the money back into political campaigns. Yeah, we'll see what effect this Supreme Court decision that came down last week will have. It's called McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission. Um, essentially what it did was strike down another of the campaign finance rules which limits the total uh, donations that an individual could give to campaigns and party committees. Uh, previously, it was around $123,000 per election cycle. Now they can give as much as to as many candidates and party committees as they want. So that might mean that uh, candidates say, hey, don't give to that outside group, give it directly to me, I can do a better job with it. And maybe that will decrease the outside spending. Or maybe donors now will just be adding more zeros to their checks to both of these uh, yes. different entities. The water level will be rising for all ships, I, I imagine, here. As far as the information you got, the, the Center for Responsive Politics. Talk to us about those folks. Sure. Well, this is a, a nonpartisan, nonprofit group in Washington, D.C., which is one of the premier uh, organizations that tracks this money in politics. And we work with them uh, frequently to help us understand and get the data on these campaigns. And so they provided some of this data, um, especially on the to date spending, uh, which would have been a much more difficult task if we had taken it from the FEC ourselves. And then we analyzed all the data and came up with uh, these trends. What I find interesting is there are no Senate races this year, and yet we saw the graph that it was just ridiculous for 2014. And we mentioned that mostly conservative groups seem to be early spenders here, but that, uh, that race to replace uh, Ed Pastor, you've got Democrats fighting amongst themselves in that one. I would imagine a lot of outside groups might be interested in that race. Yeah, that should be interesting. It's a Democratic primary, so you're, uh, it's a safe Democratic seat. So really, a Republican doesn't have a chance. We're not going to see Republican spending. What's going to happen, potentially, is outside groups that represent different demographics, different interests, may play in here. For instance, Ruben Gallego um, is an Iraq war veteran. There is probably going to be a veterans organization coming mm -hmm. to back him. Um, Mary Rose Wilcox might get a kind of women's democratic group. Um, Steve Gallardo may get an LGBT group backing him. And so we may see this kind of proxy battle, yeah. these groups supporting these oh candidates with ads. And again, what they're doing is they're donating money to get mostly television ads, but ads in general out there. Is there any research to show how effective these ads are? Because I know a lot of people, the minute they see these things, and especially later on in the election cycle, uh, switch. They're gone. They're not only gone, they look at the ad and they go, I'm not going to trust that person. It could boomerang on them, couldn't it? 
Absolutely, I think it's an open question right now. There is research to show that uh, just the volume of negative advertising that has really been raised in, pa in recent elections has turned off a lot of people from politics. And so there's one strain of thought that uh, you know this may have an overall negative effect on turnout, on people actually trusting and wanting to vote. Um, but then again, you know, some of these races have, uh, really, you know, the tide has turned with a lot of infusions of money, and so money talks sometimes. I was going to say, if it didn't work, they wouldn't be spending the money, and you wouldn't see advertising because it does work. People do watch ads, and they do make the movement. Well, again, great work on this, and I'm assuming this story is to be continued. Absolutely. It's still early in the election cycle, so we'll be watching it um, all the way through November. And to read the full story, people can go to politics.azcentral.com and search for outside groups. Very good. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The Arizona Museum of Natural History has been operating in Mesa since the 1970s, exhibiting tens of thousands of scientific and nature-oriented objects and photographs. Our sister station in Tucson, KUAT, recently took a video tour of the museum. It looks like an elephant, doesn't it? It has a big, long trunk, but look how big those tusks are. They go all the way up like that. That was a mammoth. Believe it or not, Arizona prehistorically was home to five different species of elephants. And even when you walk into the lobby, you can see three different kinds of elephant can. And I think that's really exciting. It's a great place to spend time with your family, with your friends, and enjoy an outing together. Our mission is to inspire wonder and understanding of the cultural and natural history of the Southwest. And I know that's really broad, but we want to bring it to life for people with dioramas, with these big spectacular skeletons, with the wow factor of a flash flood. It's grown, it's become part of the community, and we see generations of people that remembered coming here as a child, they bring their children here. That's one of my very favorite things. Parents tend to get busy doing the day-to-day -day things, so I like to take my niece and nephews and kind of go do and see historical things. It's something indoors, it's nice and cool, you know, so it's something really enjoyable for everybody. And I think it's something that becomes a memory for them, you know, as well as something interesting and, and fun for me. I've never been here before, so my aunt took me for the first time, and so far I love it. I liked about the rocks and how um, they were formed a long time ago. And, so, and also the fossils, they were really amazing. It's so beautiful, I mean, it just takes your breath away every time just to see, um, you know, what's preserved here and what's presented here. And, uh, you know, I think it really gives you a perspective of, you know, where we are. You know, our world seems so big and huge, and yet when you see it in the bigger picture of things, it's very moving to, you know, see where we are in the grand scheme of things. We have a very, lot of horned dinosaurs here. That one over there is Pentaceratops. And what's penta mean? Anyone know? I'll give you a hint. Behind us is Triceratops. How many people have heard about Triceratops before? There you go. Well, we're standing in a portion of the museum where we go through the geologic record time by time or era by era so that you go from ancient Arizona uh, to uh, 300 million years ago to 200 million years ago to 100 million years ago and look at the changes through time. And, and that's kind of cool. They're kind of like snapshots in a, in a photo album. Behind us is uh, one featuring what, what I call the Naco Ocean, which is an ancient shallow sea that covered Arizona about 300 million years ago. And this is one of several times that the ocean either covered large parts of Arizona or sometimes just small parts of Arizona, the little stringer of the ocean came in. I just finished learning that, that it was really a long time ago, it was really underwater, which was really surprising to me. This is a Hohokam pit house. Can you imagine all of you living in a pit house like this, the whole family? This is the Southwest Gallery, 
And uh, here, every, uh, we get to learn about the amazing Hohokam people who lived here in the valley over a thousand years ago. They really were truly amazing. Uh, they were the first farmers of the desert and incredible artisans. And right now, we're standing in a Hohokam village. They covered a large amount of Arizona, actually, up as far as uh, Deer Valley and down uh, as far as Tucson. So they uh, have quite an extensive area. And this museum has everything. We follow the whole history of the life on the planet, right from single-celled organisms to the mighty, wondrous dinosaurs and onto our anthropology uh, section, learning about the amazing Hohokam and through history. And there's lots of wonderful hands-on activities here to do. So kids love it, parents love it, full of really good enriching programming and information. I think for um, the kids, you know, for my nieces and nephews, it kind of opens up a world and they start thinking about, wow, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could go study geology and be fascinated by these kinds of amazing things that are, that's natural and all around us, and yet sometimes we just don't pay attention to it. For more information on the Arizona Museum of Natural History, check out their website at azmnh.org. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at a group that's working to help kids and adults appreciate the diversity of desert living. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Steve Aaron introduce us to the people and wildlife involved in Audubon, Arizona. We're just going to head on west over here. Along Amber the Houston's office has a pretty nice view. I am the weekend teacher naturalist here at Audubon, Arizona. Here's her version of ringing phones, dinging emails, and chirping texts. There are no angry customers out here, only curious ones. You see where the beaver have chewed? You can actually see their teeth marks. Oh, wow, you can. All along. Just right around here. They've chewed down this tree and they've just taken off the portions of the branches that they really want and they just drag them away. Yes, but, but when they bite it, do they leave germs on? I, maybe. <laughs> That's a good question. These Boy Scouts are learning about the Rio Salado Habitat Restoration Area. So this is the Salt River right here. This is what, or what used to be very, very full. That was before the dams were built. When the river dried up, people started dumping trash, tires, and junk cars in and along the riverbed. They destroyed more than 90 percent of the native habitat. This was the most degraded place in Phoenix 15 years ago. Audubon, Arizona Executive Director Sarah Porter witnessed the transformation. With the help of federal funding, Phoenix removed nearly 1,200 tons of tires, and added more than 75,000 trees, shrubs, and plants. So the Sonoran Desert is the most biodiverse desert in the world. It's really an extraordinary place. I think we're lucky to live here. We have amazing diversity of animals and plants here. They've identified more than 200 species of birds. The 600-acre restoration area is also home to jackrabbits, coyotes, and beavers all less than two miles from downtown. What is so neat and to you guys about coming out to places and seeing places like this? What you do you to, guys get out of it? You get to go out and you're not in the city anymore and there's no loud noises, it's just nice. Like, it's just open, it's quiet. Quiet, it's like being out in the middle of nowhere, but you're yeah. not, right? You get to see like it. It's like it is. And like, especially at night when you can look up and see the stars, you can't really see that in the city, so. In southeastern Arizona, Audubon manages an 8,000-acre ranch devoted to grasslands research. We know that humans have had a big impact on native habitats in Arizona, and when we have a place where we uh, keep it aside, we give land managers a chance to have a baseline, for one thing, so they can learn what a healthy native grassland would look like. And um, it allows scientists to come in and see whether there are ways we could control the impacts of invasive grass, grass species like buffalo grass. Audubon also conducts annual bird surveys and offers educational and volunteer programs. This is a coma, and a coma is a red-tailed hawk. We think that when people get a chance to be personally involved in protecting the environment, then they're going to be really informed when environmental questions come in the future and besides it makes people feel really good. In the city I know it's beautiful but but sometimes we need to go get some nature. 
Audubon, Arizona is holding its annual migration celebration in Phoenix this weekend. The free family friendly event will feature live animals, arts and crafts. For more information, az.audubon.org. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.